I'm Dr. Cheryl Knoll. I'm the chair of the School of Business, and I would like to welcome you to Lumpkin Hall's Roberson Auditorium and this evening's presentation. I think you're in for a treat this evening, and I'm really excited to hear what our guest speaker has to say. He will be introduced in just a few minutes. Because of very generous donors, we are indeed fortunate to have such a beautiful building and this venue in which we can host these kinds of events. This evening's event is made possible by the generosity of Mr. Dennis Spice. Thank you for joining us and thank you for sponsoring. He is an EIU School of Business MBA alum. We thank you for your support of entrepreneurship education. I would like to introduce Dr. Marco Grunhagen, who is the Lumpkin Distinguished Professor of Entrepreneurship in the School of Business. He is responsible for coordinating the events in support of Global Entrepreneurship <coughs> Week. And he has the uh, assistance of his wonderful graduate assistant, uh, and we do thank her for all of her support in this uh, event. Dr. Grunhagen will bring welcoming remarks and will introduce this evening's <coughs> presenter. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> hey. Um, my name is Dr. Marco Grunhagen. I'm the Lumpkin Distinguished Professor of Entrepreneurship here in the School of Business at Eastern Illinois University, and I'm your host for the evening. Tonight's event is held during Global Entrepreneurship Week, a globally designated week of celebration of the entrepreneurial spirit, and we're very proud to host two Hallmark events for the second year here in the School of Business during this special week. It allows us to showcase the expertise and the contributions that the study of business in general and of entrepreneurial ventures in particular contributes to the local, the national, and even the global economy. This is the second year that we are operating our new minor in entrepreneurship, a campus-wide minor housed in the School of Business, and we're very encouraged by over 40 students from across the EIU campus who have already chosen entrepreneurship as their minor concentration. As you may know, tomorrow evening, we're holding a panel on franchising here in the same auditorium at the same time, and we will have, have several blue chip panelists in attendance, among them the Executive Vice President of Midas International, and the Assistant Attorney General for the State of Illinois as we discuss the ins and outs of franchising and we invite all of you to attend and to spread the word. Now to tonight's event. Eastern Illinois University has made it a focus to be at the forefront of the renewable energy movement and green initiatives are literally sprouting all over campus. Just a month ago, we witnessed the grand opening of the Renewable Energy Center on campus, one of the largest biomass renewable energy projects in the nation. Related to it, we now have also a new Center for Clean Energy Research and Education with the auspicious SINCERE acronym and an emerging master's program in sustainable energy. From the vantage point of the School of Business, we see many promising opportunities to be involved with SINCERE in the creation and advancement of new ventures and startups related to green initiatives. And that is why we have invited our speaker for tonight. Dr. John Gr Gr Griedel is a professor of economics and part of the public policy, economic development, and marketing research staff at the Illinois Institute of Rural Affairs at Western Illinois University. And contrary to what many of us have observed in the political arena, academia is a place where knowledge only gets advanced if we reach across the aisle and collaborate with fellow researchers, even and particularly from other institutions, and in this case, from a sister school from the other side of the state. Dr. Gridel earned a PhD in Agricultural and Applied Economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and currently he directs the Midwest Community, Community Development Institute, one of only five sites in the country that provides a certification program in the field of community development. And among other topics, he has conducted research into the need for green jobs in rural Illinois, and that is the subject of this presentation tonight. Dr. Gridel. Are you able to hear me? Excellent. Thank you very much for those comments, Dr. Grunhagen. Um,
There we go, getting the technology to work here. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation, uh, especially to be here during Global Entrepreneurship Week. What I'd like to talk to you about are some of the green opportunities uh, that can lead to entrepreneurship in rural Illinois. As uh, Dr. Grunhagen mentioned, I voyaged here from Macomb in Western Illinois, which is the site of Western Illinois University, along mostly two-lane road to uh, eventually arrive here in Charleston. Uh, neither, as you know, neither community is very easy to get to. How many people have been to Macomb? Look at that. We've got a lot of people who've been to Macomb. Excellent. I'd never been to Charleston before. But I'm struck by all the similarities to Macomb. It's incredible. But if you take out a typical map of the state of Illinois, uh, such as the one that you see in the slide, there are many smaller communities uh, up here on the map. Sterling, Illinois is there. Uh, Danville, Mount Vernon, Marion. But you will not see Macomb. And you will not see Charleston. Although, I must say, Charleston, uh, Mattoon is on the map, so I don't know how you think about that. Maybe you think of Mattoon as being part of the greater metropolitan area of Charleston, or uh, how do you view that? I'm not sure. But I think both of these universities, Western Illinois University and Eastern, are very important to their regions. They're very important. And I'm so glad that EIU has this interest in entrepreneurship because I think it's so important for, for the region. I would revise the map slightly and I would add Rocky the Bulldog there with the depiction of WIU and the panther. Does the panther have a name? Philly? Philly? Billy, Billy the Panther, okay. So we got Rocky the Bulldog and Billy the Panther. This is how I think uh, the map should look and would give a better idea of the importance of these institutions in the state of Illinois. So we're gonna start as, uh, as it seems to be appropriate today since this is Global Entrepreneurship Week with a global view because of a lot of the opportunities for green enterprises really arise because of what's happening globally. Then I'll talk about some four rather broad opportunities for rural Illinois in light of the, the global situation, which is an increasingly resource, uh, has an increasing resource deficit. So how can we use our natural resources in rural Illinois to, to help with this global situation? Next, I'm going to invite your participation. I understand some of you get extra credit for being here. So I'm going to put you to work with a, with a particular problem and ask for you to think creatively about that problem. For you to think like an entrepreneur who might convert a problem to an opportunity. So I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. Uh, then I'll provide a few examples of green entrepreneurs uh, that I've ha had a pleasure to, to meet or to hear about uh, in the region. And then finally, we'll close about what happens next. Um, let, me, let me begin with a little bit of a story, however. I want to begin with a little bit of a story. Um, as you may know, there, there's a major environmental problem in the Illinois River. And that is, there's an invasive species, the Asian carp, which is a, a very aggressive predator and has decimated a lot of the, the native fish species in that river. There's a lot of concern now that the Asian carp will get up uh, into Lake Michigan and get into that whole ecosystem as well. Uh, so there's tremendous concern about this, even legal action where other states are suing Illinois to prevent the Asian carp 
uh, to insist that there be a total blockage of the Illinois River to prevent the Asian carp from getting up into Lake Michigan. Well, a group of uh, business people in Pike County, Illinois, were grappling with this situation. And what they discovered was that although the Asian carp is not a fish that's desirable for our palate, Americans tend not to want to eat Asian carp. They are considered a delicacy in China. So these business people made contact with China, brought over a few China business people to sort of evaluate the Asian carp uh, proliferating in the Illinois River. And what the, what the Chinese people said was that this was, an, this was excellent wild carp. They considered it to be wild Asian carp. So these business people have set up an enterprise and they've signed multi-million dollar contracts with Chinese entities to ship over Asian fillets of Asian carp to China. And they are currently expanding the operation. Their current capacity isn't sufficient for the demand that, that they're finding in China for this product. So I mention this as an example. This is what entrepreneurship is about. This is about innovation. It's about making, you know, taking those lemons and making lemonade out of them. So that's a little bit of the thrust of what I want to talk with you about today, about entrepreneurship and the importance of innovation and how there are some tremendous opportunities coming up in the area of the green sector. Uh, beginning, let me go back to that one. Let's see. Times they are changing. Talk about a global, we'll start with a little bit of a global perspective here. You notice this looks a little different than our typical depiction of, of the globe, doesn't it? Ah, I, ha I have a special laser here I can use. Uh, we're, we're not used to this orientation. I did this intentionally. Uh, th this is an orientation toward Asia. You see Japan, China, India. Uh, that may be appropriate for us to uh, adopt that perspective on occasion. So I'm going to talk about a lot of changes that are happening in the world at a very frenetic pace. It's happening very quickly. Sometimes it's a little scary, I think, all the changes that are happening in the world. It's a little bit like the blob. Here's Jimmy Stewart. He's fighting off the blob. The blob are some of these changes, these forces that are happening, that are happening across the world and upsetting, upsetting our lifestyle. Another, I love this one, even better. Any vegetarians in the, in the audience? Well, you wouldn't be if you saw this uh, movie about the killer tomatoes that are eating France. And there's the Eiffel Tower, no doubt being devoured by these killer tomatoes. You'll never go veg again. So we're, we feel sometimes that we're under attack by the forces of change. I want to summarize some of those forces of change for you and make the argument that yes, there are huge challenges here, but also there are opportunities. So let me begin with a quick uh, discussion of trends in world population. You may have heard just recently that the world's population just reached seven billion people. That's billion with a B. The growth, however, is by and large in the less developed countries. If you notice here, the uh, The reddish block here is pretty constant population. That's in the, the more advanced countries, whereas you see in the less developed countries, there's tremendous population growth. So that's where the growth is happening. What's more, if you look at 
the age distribution in the developing world, and that's the one on the right. And you can see along, whoops, press the wrong button there. You can see this is the age, increasing age along this axis. You can see the concentration in the developing world of very young people, right? Ages 20 and under are the biggest numbers. Whereas when you get into the developed world, the largest numbers are in this 40 on up, the baby boomers and so forth. So not only are populations increasing in the developing country, countries, but they, are, they have a large number of young people. Uh, a couple of things that might surprise you uh, that are consistent with this. Within the next 10 years, India's working population is going to increase by 250 million people. To almost 900 million people in the working age group. In the next 20 years, half of all the new buildings in the world are going to be built in China. Half the buildings in the entire world are going to be built in one country. We also see not only the population growth in the developing world, but that in low and middle income countries, approximately 30% of all children are underweight. This map is, is a little hard to read. The white areas indicate that the data is not available. The sort of reddish, I don't know what color, whoops. Um, the, this color indicates less than 10% of children. These are children under five years old, um, percentage that are underweight. But you can see um, Africa, India, Southeast Asia, tremendous number of underweight, underweight children. Put it, put it very simply, the world is hungry. There's a lot of hungry children and large numbers of them across the world. Meanwhile, what's happening to our resources, our natural resources worldwide? You know, maybe this is where the killer tomatoes start coming in. But about uh, as much as two-thirds of the world's population could be water stressed by 2025. Our aquifers, by and large, are being depleted at a faster rate than nature can replenish them. Population uh, pollution, excuse me, and many rivers and lakes, particularly in China, India, but even here in the United States, are seriously polluted, so the availability of, of drinking water is diminished. Another important resource, energy. The world currently, or 2.5 billion people, burn wood and animal dung as their chief source of energy. energy. 1.5 billion people do not have electricity. Okay? As these countries develop, what is going to happen? What are they going to demand as they grow in income? As they certainly are. They're going to want heating and cooling. They're going to want electricity. They're going to want cars. In fact, the fastest auto, fastest market for automobiles is now China. What do all these, all these things that we take for granted require? They require energy. Right now, global energy consumption is equivalent to about 230 million barrels of oil per day. 80% of that comes from, from fossil fuels. The expectation is by 2020, energy consumption will increase, or 2030, energy consumption will increase by 50%. Still, 80% of that will be from fossil fuels. So what we have, in spite of the rapid growth of renewable, renewable fuels, and we'll talk more about that, 
they're not able to gain a significant share of the overall consumption of energy. Peak oil may be occurring right now. There's some debate about this, or may soon occur. Peak oil doesn't mean that oil is totally depleted worldwide. It means rather that the consumption, or I'm sorry, the production of oil is at its optimum. It's at its highest point. From there, production begins to decline. Climate change, another worldwide issue that's affecting us. According to the Kyoto Treaty, uh, it would result in a 5% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. Some scientists are now saying that up to a 70% reduction in emissions would be required to stabilize the planet. Some private companies are taking advantage or being entrepreneurial, I guess we might say, about this. Shell, for example, assumes that there's a notational price of $40 per ton of carbon when they make their investment decisions. So they're already taking into account the price of carbon when they make their decisions. Now, as you probably know, there has not been any decision in the US or worldwide to, to move to a carbon price or to move to a cap and trade system. But private companies, many of them are hungry for that because that would provide them with some certainty. And then they could innovate with efficiency. They can innovate with ways to sequester carbon, other uh, technologies that will be profitable to them. In fact, the, the McKinsey Global Institute estimates that using re energy and resources more efficiently could save nearly $3 trillion per year by 2030. So what I'm saying is, put it very simply, clay and firms can make a lot of filthy cash. There's a lot of money to be made out there. Walmart estimates, just for one example, they save about $200 million a year in fuel alone by being more efficient. A little more elaborate of a discussion of this. What does this mean to us? I'm bombarding you with the, uh, the blob uh, and the killer tomatoes. But what does this mean to us? A couple things are clear. One, there's an energy revolution coming. The demand for energy, the conversion to renewals, renewable sources of energy is a real thing. It's happening. The world will be hungry. The demand for food is going to continue to skyrocket worldwide. The world will need water and other resources. We're facing a world where there's deficits in these vital natural resources. That is the global situation. Climate change is another piece of that. Are we ready for this? Are we ready for this individually would be one question. Are we ready for this on the community level? is more the question I'm, that I'm posing to you. Are we ready for these drastic changes that are happening now? Well, as I said when I started, there's also opportunities in the midst of these challenges. What opportunities are there for rural Illinois? Well, this photo illustrates the idea that rural Illinois, this area around Charleston, this area around Macomb in western Illinois, are very resource, natural resource rich. Okay? The photo sort of illustrates that. We've got some of the, the best agricultural 
productivity, let me try that again. Our land is some of the most productive in the world. Okay, corn growing there. I heard a speaker, Jim Nolan, from the University of Illinois recently talk about Illinois as the Saudi Arabia of oil. I've never heard that expression before. But we don't have to irrigate it, right? We have bountiful rain, sometimes more than we want. Uh, biomass, right? We have abundant biomass. If you can consider corn stover, the residual after harvesting corn, if you consider uh, some of the woodlands, and uh, I know, for example, your plant here use, uses wood chips. Okay? So we have an abundance in these resources. And what I'm suggesting to you is how rural areas utilize these natural resources will be one of the keys to their future viability. So it's really going to be important how we manage our natural resources, using them to gain income, yes, but also maintaining and protecting them. A huge issue for our rural communities. So let's talk about a little more specifically what some of the opportunities are in the green sector. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a chair from my nephew's school from some years ago. I don't know if you can read it, but it says, I can make better choices. And my nephew sat in that chair quite a bit, by the way. Although he's doing really well now, but at that time, he spent a lot of time sitting in the I can make better choices chair. Okay. Well, that is somewhat the situation that I think our rural communities are in. We need to make wise choices in how we utilize our natural, our natural resources. What are some, and we need to be anticipating these changes that are happening globally and realizing uh, uh, the old adage, you know, th think global, act local. I think that's so, so very applicable in this situation. We need to understand the global so that we can take advantage of it on our, in, our local, in our local economies and manage our local environment accordingly. So I'm proposing four main areas that are green opportunities for rural Illinois. The first one is energy efficiency. In particular, retrofitting buildings. Second one is wind power. Uh, third, advanced biofuels. Okay, you don't need to tell you don't need me to tell you about that one. You're demonstrating right, right on your campus with your new heating and cooling system. So advanced biofuels means we're beyond using just the corn kernel to produce ethanol. All right, that's what's done at a lot of plants. That's maybe stage one. The advanced biofuels we're looking at cellulosic. We're looking at uh, looking the, using the corn stover, the corn residue, wood chips algae, all kinds of other things, the potential for those to produce fuel or to be used directly in heating, or in cooling, or to produce electricity. Switchgrass, pennycress, new crops are being formulated that um, have high value as biomass. So this is a huge area that's, that we are well positioned in Illinois. We have a real strategic advantage with that area. Uh, local foods is another one that I think is, is burgeoning. That's partly a matter of the, the taste of con consumers. What, there's more of a concern about what we eat and is it healthy and nutritious, so forth. But it's also, I think, stimulated by the fact that it's expensive to bring tomatoes 2,000 miles to Charleston, Illinois, from Mexico. Right? There's a lot of energy used in doing that. So we're beginning to look at alternatives. So these are four areas that I think regions around Charleston and regions around Macomb need to be looking at for, for their future. 
I'm going to talk very briefly about each one of these. And then I'm going to ask you to take a look at a particular problem and see what you can come up with for creative solutions. Uh, I love this quote by Stephen Chu. He's a former uh, Nobel Prize winner. Now he's the Secretary of Energy. And he said that we make refrigerators that are four times more efficient than the ones we made in 1975 for half the inflation adjusted cost. The energy we save with these refrigerators is more than all the wind and solar energy that are produced in the United States today. Just refrigerators have that much of an impact on energy savings. Estimates are that with greater energy efficiency, we could reduce our fuel consumption by 23% in the next 20 years. Um, wind power, okay? Um, we, uh, I, I see a number of wind turbines driving here. I know there's a number of them a little bit farther north, like in McLean County especially. In our area, a little bit north of Macomb, there's a huge wind project that's coming in with uh, 125, 150 turbines. Um, but if you go back to 2000, this was a situation, this map shows the megawatts of wind power capacity by state. Um, Iowa was the leader, or no, Minnesota, or no, California actually, 1,646 megawatts. Uh, in the period until 2009, there was a dramatic increase in capacity. Um, up to 35,000 megawatts nearly nationally. And I'm sure it's higher than that now. Illinois is now fourth nationally in production of, of wind power. Texas is far and away ahead with uh, 9,400. Uh, I believe Iowa is second with 3,604. Minnesota's third, Illinois's fourth. In, a, in Illinois, we have mostly class three winds. Um, there's some areas with class four winds. So we don't have the most powerful winds, not compared to Texas at least. But a strategic advantage we do have is that our uh, electrical distribution system, our grid, is able to take additional capacity. So we are able to move, that's a key issue with the wind, is moving it from the point of generation to the point of consumption. We're very advantaged in that area, so that's one reason you see the proliferation of wind. Our institute is working now with uh, school districts and other nonprofits organizations that are putting in wind turbines, smaller ones, both for generation of wind and also as an educational tool. So wind power. Um, and bioenergy, of course. I'm not sure how well you're able to see this, but the, the sort of, uh, whoops, I insist on doing that, don't I? The uh, ethanol plants are kind of the diamond shaped ones. Now these are the, the corn to ethanol, using the corn kernels and uh, producing ethanol. So you see some of those up here near Kiwani and up in, uh, nope, not there so much. Uh, Fulton County, Peoria, near Peoria, so forth. There's the biomass, of course, Charleston stands out here with your biomass, heat, and power. There's a couple other of those across the state. Um, and a few others planned. Then there's also the circular ones are biodiesel plants that are also a number of those around the state, as you can see. Um, so biofuels is another area of great promise, I think, for our, our rural communities. Um, and the technology is developing rapidly here. It'll be very interesting to see where the breakthrough is in terms of uh, what substances are, can most efficiently be converted into, into ethanol. Um, and of course, you probably recognize this building. So you have an example right here 
of advanced biofuels that is a model for the state, really, in terms of what is possible. Okay, so those are four broad areas, uh, broad opportunities for rural areas. But if, uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you can't, uh, you know, you can't focus on such broad areas. You need to be more specific. So I'm going to give you a specific problem. And first let me explain the method we're going to use. It's called scampers. Anybody use scamper before? Scamper is a way to uh, creatively create new ideas um, to solve problems in a real creative way. It's based on the idea that nearly every new idea is, is a modification of another idea. So I'm going to break you into seven groups, and I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do that, but uh, it'll be fun to try. Um, each letter in Scamper represents one approach to problem solving. Uh, S stands for substitute. So in that, you're thinking of can you replace part of the problem or process with something else. Often with replacing it, you can come up with new ideas. Combining. Combining is when you bring two or more parts of the problem together to create a different product. Adapting. Is there a similar problem, process, somewhere else that we can adapt to this situation? Magnify. How can you magnify or exaggerate your idea? Is there a part of it that you want to magnify and do more of a part you want to do less of? Put to other uses. Can we take our current idea and apply it somewhere else to make it useful? Eliminate or minify. Uh, is there a part of it that we want to stop doing or minimize doing? And finally, the last one is uh, rearrange or reverse. An example might be, uh, I know you're having franchising tomorrow, Ray Kroc when he did McDonald's, right? Uh, one thing Ray Kroc did was he put to other uses. He didn't just sell hamburgers. He decided to sell, he could sell real estate and restaurants as well, okay? He also eliminated, he, uh, he said, well, we can uh, go to self-service in our restaurants. We eliminate waitresses that way. Okay? By eliminating that, he begins to come up with a different business model. Uh, rearrange or reverse. Well, we have customers pay uh, first before they get the food rather than afterwards. So he's rearranging the process. And that also affects the, the way the business works. Okay. So I have more detail, I have questions that can help guide you. But what I'm going to ask you to do is to consider this kind of specific problem here. How could we reduce resource use here in Lepkin Hall? Okay. How can we reduce resource use? And I'm going to ask one group to be the substitute group. And I'll ask, uh, let's see, maybe, oh, I won't move then. <laughs> I'll ask the uh, first three rows here, a few people come together into a group. And here are some questions that you can use to begin to guide your thinking. Here, pass this to someone else. So please come together. Uh, we don't have much time, so I'm asking you to move quickly here. Um, would you do me a favor? Would you pass these out? Yes, absolutely. Um, then I would ask um, the next uh, three rows to come together into a group. And you will be the uh, combined, you will be the combined group. And then the uh, people who are hiding way in the back there, you'll be the adapt group. Okay. So you're the adapt group. 
Now you have 10 minutes to get together and come up with ideas here. Okay, we don't have a lot of time, so please move together and uh, begin brainstorming. Magnify group will take what the first three rows here. You're in the magnify group. Put to other uses group. Put to other uses group would be the, the next three rows. And then way in the back, the uh, folks way in the back would be the eliminate or minify, minify group, okay? So, for example, if you are in the uh, if you are in the eliminate or minify group, you might begin to think about what resources can we eliminate, can we can reduce our pr production of, or eliminate producing completely, and begin to think of some specific ideas of how that can be done. Okay, I'm interested in uh, hearing some of your ideas uh, using the scamper approach to reduce uh, resource use here in Lumpkin Hall. Uh, let's begin with our S group. S stands for substitute. What ideas do you have? Um, about, uh, Stand up and say it, say it loud. loud. Yeah, <laughs> so everybody can hear it. Oh I know, I know. Okay, so, um, I'm putting you on the spot. Okay. Uh -huh. Time they have probably because anything could make it go off, you know, or tamper with it. Um, uh -huh. mute, um, she was talking about that actually the projectors, there's actually a mute button so that, like, for instance, when if there's a slide up and the teacher's still talking, you actually save energy by muting it because the, the slide will still stay up, uh -huh. but it, at the projector light will continue to stay on, so you actually save energy by that. Um, we were saying that with the computers, that how many computers are downstairs that um, if, even though MacBooks are more expensive, they are uh, more energy efficient with like battery use. You wouldn't have to have it plugged in as long as the PCs that are downstairs. And um, we also talked about like solar paneling on the roof. And, um, and then we also said the water fountains because they spill all over and so there wouldn't be water. All right, awesome, round of applause. Good, good ideas. How about our C group? Our C was for Change, change. Uh, or combine, I'm sorry, I forgot what it stood for. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> combine, thanks. What do you come up, what ideas do you have? One of ours was uh, combining lights and uh, like sun, or like roof windows. You can use the sun for like roof windows. Yeah. And then uh, they have more beds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there'd be a solar thing going on too. Combine lectures so you use less light, like make a, like a bigger classroom and use less light. Okay. Like a three hour long class. Uh, class outside a couple of times, you combine two. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, we'll propose that to the administration. <laughs> Okay, reduce, reducing paper that way. Okay, okay, <laughs> great, thank you. The third group is the uh, adapt, adapt group, right? Do I have that one right? Okay, what did you come up with, group three?
Okay. So you're adapting things. Very, very good. Uh, magnify. We had a lot of the same ideas, like magnify recycling, just try to promote it more, like uh -huh. recycling paper and stuff. Um, also, the motion detector lights, like magnify it, have more in every room, so save uh, electricity that way. And then magnify turning off projectors after every class because they take up so much energy. So just have it like after every lecture, have so many shutter blocks. Uh, and do that way. That's about it. Okay. Magnify. Put to other uses. We have a lot of the same ideas, it's just we look at it in one level. Okay. Basically, the only difference we have is like turn off so much air, turn off like the entire room. What's that? What's that? I can't hear you. I was like, well, the, only, the only difference that we had from yeah. the walls was just like wind and power and lighting was like the track of the walls. Like, we're not occupying this entire room. We just have the track of wall wall and it's all done on one side. And we just track, track the lighting, track the wind. Uh, very good, very good. Okay. Eliminate. Do you have anything new, anything that hasn't been talked about? Okay, eliminate group. Okay, so um, you might ask, all right, this is a cutesy thing to do, but wh wh what are we doing this for? And a couple of reasons. Um, one is that this is sort of the process that entrepreneurs need to go through. Maybe they don't follow the scamper method, you know, but entrepreneurship is all about finding creative solutions to these problems and making a business out of it. Right? So um, perhaps some of the ideas that you generated could actually be the core of a, of a business. Um, so that's one reason because I think this is the creativity that is required to be a successful entrepreneur. And I guess the second reason is that you might want to take this technique and use it in your own, in your own work uh, with your organization. Uh, it's got, it can be used in a whole wide variety of contexts. And if you want to learn more about it, you can just like Google Scamper you know, on the web and it, it explains more about it than I've been able to explain today. Um, I want to close then with uh, a few examples uh, of green entrepreneurs. Uh, about a year ago, I did a number of interviews of people, of entrepreneurs who were starting green businesses. And in the back on the table are some profiles of green entrepreneurs. If you're interested, please grab, uh, there's like five, I think, entrepreneurs or so back there. Grab the ones that you're interested in. I'm gonna mention a couple of them, a couple of them right here. So these are people who found creative solutions to problems and made a business out of it. Uh, Joel. Joel um, was building his own house and he wanted to be environmentally friendly. He wanted to use, he wanted to, to use um, building materials that were environmentally friendly, but he found it very hard to locate those materials. And it was quite a searching process for him. So he got an idea that, hey, maybe there's a need for a building supply store that focuses on green products. 
Uh, he's located in Fairfield, Iowa, <laughs> only a couple hours from Macomb. He started out uh, just serving the local market, but now he serves nationally. Uh, he ships all over the country with some of his green building supplies. Um, another example, uh, Ed. Ed is in Mount Pleasant, Iowa. And Ed has had a dry cleaner for a long period of time and then heard all this fuss about energy savings and kind of belittled it for a while. And then it began to make more and more sense to him. So he's converted his, his dry cleaner to clean methods. Apparently one of those is some kind of wet cleaning technique that uses fewer chemicals, uses less water, uh, and so forth. Uh, he's the first fully certified green cleaner in the state of Iowa. Received four leaves from the Green Cleaning Council. Who knew? I mean, who knew there was a green, green, certified green laundry business? But that shows you how widespread the applications are of this, this idea of green. Um, one more, this might be my favorite. Uh, Lee uh, is near, near Macomb, is in western Illinois, and he has uh, purchased a patented process that takes recycled glass. And this is stuff that cities or what, whatever sanitation districts are just happy to get rid of it. So it's free. Re he recycles the glass, the, gra the glass, and it makes it into small beads, like glass beads. In turn, those are like melted together and they make boards out of those and construct houses from those boards. So at, uh, Lee makes glass houses. I don't know if he throws stones or not, but he makes glass houses. And the glass houses have an energy efficiency of R50. They're incredibly energy efficient. They're almost indestructible. They can survive a hurricane winds of or a category five hurricane. Uh, there's no insects there. Um, he's selling some of them to Indian reservations for one other reason, they're, they're, they do, do not catch on fire. And he's demonstrated this. A TV station came to interview him one time and he took a welding torch up to one of his, uh, one of his houses and it would not start on fire just to demonstrate. So if you're on an Indian reservation, a lot of the Native American reservations, they're so far away from a fire department that if a house catches on fire, it burns to the ground. Well, here's a solution to that. Um, his philosophy, if you will, or a comment that he made to me was, he compared this to wooden boats. He said wooden boats were once the standard of the boating industry, but then fiberglass boats came along. They're lighter, they're stronger. In the same way, he's looking for a transformation of the housing industry to, to glass houses. Um, So those are just a few examples. I've got a couple more in the handouts up there. Um, let me summarize just for a minute here. We've gone from a global to a very local, from global to a green cleaner. Um, but I think what's happening now is this green thing is here to stay. You know, this green thing is real. There's resource constraints throughout the world, and that is requiring us to rethink what kind of energy we have, how we get our water, how we produce our food. All these things are now up in the balance to be reconsidered. That's scary, but at the same time, it creates a lot of entrepreneur, a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurship. We see right now in California, well, or in Nevada, where there's uh, you know, acres and acres of solar panels out in the desert, right, to, to collect solar power. We've got venture capitalists investing in algae, uh, you know, making ethanol out of algae. We've got China investing billions in solar energy. And we've got Lee, we've got Lee right here in Western, Il well, in Western Illinois building glass houses because they're energy efficient and have other advantages. So. Um, entrepreneurship is vital, and I guess my parting thought here was 
that we need to keep the entrepreneurial flame burning. And I think it's really good that EIU is taking a leading role in terms of entrepreneurship, having a designated chair in entrepreneurship in the business school that uh, Dr. Grunhagen holds, having the new biofuels project, having the Global Entrepreneurship Week are all examples of what regional universities can do to support entrepreneurship among their students and among their communities. And since many of you are students, I would add one thing I don't have up here, and that is for you to think about how you can be entrepreneurial. And that may mean starting a business or a nonprofit organization, but that might not be uh, something you have the time for, but it may be doing something like studying abroad or having another experience that will increase your capacity to be innovative and creative. Because I think, uh, especially in the economy that we have now and with the changes that we're facing, to be innovative and to be entrepreneurial is gonna be vital to your future. And it'll be a lot of fun too. So thank you very much for having me. I appreciate your, your concentration. Um, I think marginally more, but I don't think a lot more. <laughs> All right, if we don't have any more questions, we have a little uh, gift for our speaker. Oh, so thank you so much. Thank you for, uh, for coming and, you. and doing this presentation thank for you, us. And, um, we're going to have a few people at dinner still tonight. So may I see what it is? Yes, it, absolutely. <laughs> it's a, here, I'll hold that for you. Thanks, thanks. It may not be the most environmentally friendly product. Oh, it's blue. What do you know? That's a surprise, huh? Very nice. Eastern Illinois University School of Business. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming.